We're going to be in the book of Luke chapter 9 today. You can go ahead and turn there. The book of Luke chapter 9. I do honor brother and sister Terry today. They are a treasure to our church. And we are so thankful for them and pray that they do have a wonderful, wonderful vacation. It's always an honor to minister here in this pulpit. I don't count it lightly. And after taking some time to prepare for this week, I'm glad I don't have to do this every week. I really do. I I have great respect for men and women of God like Brother Turner. We honor him today, and there's, there's others in this house that we honor today that have done it week in and week out and prayed and sought the Lord and been led by the Holy Ghost of God, and we're just thankful for them. But the book of Luke, chapter 9, we're going to start at the end of the chapter, verse 57. It says this. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said unto him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another, then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. What that really means is let me wait until my father dies, and then then I'll serve you. Then I'll follow you, Lord. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said, no one, say that with me, no one, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I know we've prayed, but let's pray one more time. Father God, I feel confident that this is the word that you have deposited in my spirit. Oh, God, for this day, and I pray, God, for clarity. Oh, God, I pray that the anointing of the Holy Ghost, oh, Lord, come upon me, oh, God, in a mighty way. Oh, Lord, that I could preach, oh, Lord, with the boldness, oh, God, of a Deborah. Oh, God, that I could be bold like a JL, oh, Lord. I pray that you would give me the clarity, that same clarity and anointing that you gave to Priscilla in the New Testament, oh, God. And I pray most of all for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, oh, Lord, upon this word today. I open up my mouth wide, oh God, unto you, looking unto you, and I pray, God, that you will fill it with your word for your people today. And the church said, amen and amen. Now, our subject today is distractions. And the reason that I picked that as our subject is because it is a word that I have heard all summer long. It is a word that I have heard even in my life all summer long. It is something that I've heard other people talk about all summer long. Well, this has become a distraction and that has become a distraction. And you know that through every age and every eon of time, men and women have had their own set of distractions that they've had to deal with. But I dare say that there is not a time that people have had to deal with more distractions than we have to deal with in the year 2019. Amen. We have a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week news cycle that we can turn on any time and hear bad news, bad news, bad news. It bombards our eyes and our ears. And and then we have here in the palm of our hands all the information of the world. And let me tell you, it's not all bad, but it's not all good. Just this week, in a matter of 10 minutes, I could take this phone and I could look up a recipe for ham and cheese sliders. I could take this phone and I could order something from Mike for our anniversary. I can take this phone and I can check my bank account. I can take this phone and I can be involved in one of those glorious things called a group text message. Some of y'all, if you don't know what a group text message is about, then consider yourself blessed. (laughs) Amen. So again, it's not all bad, but it's not all good. Because this is the deal. With great technology comes great responsibility 
And we are not being responsible. Even as women and men of God, we are not being responsible with our time. When you consider that the average person cannot go 10 minutes without checking their phone. My hand is up. I'm preaching to myself today. Okay? These young people that we are raising in our homes, I found this statistic. It was very sobering. We call them digital natives because they can, most of them can maneuver around the phone better than we can. But by the time they have spent their lives on social media, it will, it will total out to a total of seven years of their life that they will spend checking social media. Which leads us to ask, is that really a good use of your time? And we know the answer. But with all that being said, I just want to tell you that cell phones are not my assignment today. Texting and driving is not my assignment today. Even though you need to turn it off from time to time. And you don't need to text and drive because in the state of Georgia, it'll get you a ticket. Amen. I came for something far more serious. Because like that old song goes... The enemy of our souls is killing us softly, killing us slowly, killing us methodically. He's wearing us out, not because we're just grossly sinning or we're just grossly negligent, not because we don't come to church, not because we don't give to missions, not because we don't sing in the choir, not because we don't pay our tithe. We are being destroyed because of distraction. Amen. We are being destroyed because of distraction. So we have to start with the foundation. What does it mean when a person is distracted? And if you would go there, here's what a distraction is. A distraction is anything that diverts our attention from something of greater importance to something of lesser importance. A distraction is anything that takes our attention away from what we're supposed to be doing. Let's go to the next one. And in the case of the sons and daughters of God, distractions can be people. Distractions can be places. Distractions can be things or even mindsets that take our focus off of God's perfect will for each day that he has given us, focusing instead on the things that don't really matter, or as my grandma said, don't amount to a hill of beans. Amen? Amen. These distractions, they are killing our progress. They are killing our prayer life. They are killing our productivity. And sadly, they are killing our potential as men and women of God that make up the church of the living God. Amen. Luke 9, 62, this was at the end of what we read earlier. It says this, but Jesus told them, and this is a newer version. It says that Jesus told them, anyone who lets himself be distracted from the work that I plan for him is not fit for the kingdom of God. We have to, we have to learn to not let distractions defeat us. Amen. I'm going to be real with you today, and I'm just going to tell you about me. Because like I said, I'm not here to talk about all these external distractions. Because those are the easy things to deal with. It's easy. You can turn your notifications off on that phone. You can turn your television off. What I'm talking about today is something far more consequential. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to preach about me for a minute. Because there are days when I can create a time and a space for God to move in my life. I can get up really early before Mike gets up and before the kids get up and I can go out into my secret place and I can do what I'm supposed to do as far as time and space are concerned. But even in those days, there are times I can get down on my knees to pray, to worship, to praise the Lord. And my mind goes in a million different directions. Am I talking to anybody in this house today? 
I think about what do I have to do for work today? What do I have to do for church today? What do I have to do for Briley and for Jeb and for Mike today? What do I have to do and how do I mesh all of these different schedules and these different things in my life? How do I put them all together and make it work? And what's being, what's happening there is I'm being distracted from time with the Lord. And all too quickly, those cares of life, they can consume us. And, and that word of God that we heard on Sunday, it just kind of lies dormant in our lives. It's forgotten about because we are distracted. My intentions are good. My, my heart longs for communion. But my mind wanders. And I get so frustrated. Am I just talking about me this morning? Or am I talking about all of us this morning? Our mind wanders and we have to pull it back in and we have to rein it back in. And and, and it doesn't take but maybe three or four times when it happens like that and we just totally neglect that time in that place that we know that we need so desperately because we're frustrated. If we're not careful, one of the chief things that the enemy is doing in this day and time in which we live is he will wear us down. He will wear us down through our distractions. He will wear us down through other methods that he is so cunning and so sneaky in using, but he can wear us down. And and, and if we let him keep wearing us down, then we're going to wear out and we're going to give up and we're going to stop our forward progress in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Not only, not only do we deal with all of these external things, but Jesus said this. He said, take no thought. Multiple times, actually seven times in the New Testament, Jesus said, take no thought for your life. Take no thought for tomorrow. Take no thought. And you know, he said that for a reason, because the devil is a good devil. He's good at what he does, and he keeps offering up thoughts to us day in and day out. He keeps launching those fiery darts at us because he knows he can't touch us because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Jesus. But do you know he's not going to stop launching those fiery darts? He's not going to stop offering those thoughts that would distract us. But just because he offers them doesn't mean we have to take them. Just because there's a difference, and we've heard this before, there's a difference between a bird flying over your head than you letting a bird build a nest in the top of your hair. Amen. And if we don't learn to renew our minds, and if we don't learn to live above distractions, then we're going to walk around in defeat. But I don't know about you. I'm ready to live above. Anybody else ready to live above? Amen. Here's the first thing. We can be distracted by this, our daily routine. And I've talked a little bit about this. We can be distracted by the things that we do each and every day. And most of them are not bad things at all. Most of them are good things. It's easy to get so consumed by the things that we have to do with each day that is set before us. It's easy to just grab our coffee and head out the door and have good intentions of maybe praying in the car and then the phone rings and you can't have your personal prayer time. It's easy to just get out the door without ever acknowledging to the Lord that I need you this day. Anybody else in the house today? Am I just preaching to myself? Oh, my Lord. In Luke chapter 10, Mary was basically ratted out by her sister Martha because she was not helping get the house in order. But instead, she chose to spend that time sitting at the feet of Jesus. And what was Jesus's response? This is what he said. But there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has found it and it will not be taken away from her. Friends, I think it's a needful reminder for all of us in the house today that the 
busier you are, the more you need to come and sit at the feet of Jesus. It's not just for the pastor to come. It's not just for the worship leader to come. It's not just for the super spiritual to come. It's for all of us. It's a life giving habit that you have to have in your life. If you want to make it, we have to incorporate it into our daily routine. If we ever want to walk in victory, because I'm just going to be honest. I thank God for prayer lines, but we don't always get everything that we need in a prayer line. Sometimes we've got to learn to walk in it day in and walk in it day out and let the Holy Ghost lead us day in and let the Holy Ghost lead us day out. But if we never come and say, Jesus, I need you to help me this day. Hallelujah. It's critical. It's critical. What you do daily will determine your destiny. What you don't do daily will determine your destiny. I was thinking on this topic and I thought about Jesus telling the disciples, he said, go ye. But do you know first, before he had to go ye for the disciples, he said, tarry ye. He said, you better wait in Jerusalem. You better wait for the Holy Ghost. And we know that they did that and they stayed and they tarried in that place and they waited and the Holy Ghost fell on them. And we're so thankful for the Holy Ghost and how he fell. We're thankful for all that he brought when he came. But I just want to tell you, you better learn to tarry before you go. You better learn to wait on the Lord before you go out and do the work, even the work of the Lord. Amen. Don't be distracted by your daily routine. That's the first one. And here's the second one. We can be distracted by our dreams and our plans. And this is so contrary to what you hear from so many mouths, even in the pulpit. And we need to have dreams and we need to have plans and we need to have goals and we need to have vision. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with those things, but it's so easy to get wrapped up in things that might be good, that might not be sin, but they're not God's will for our lives. It's easy to make plans for our future and never stop and ask God, what are his thoughts on those plans? It's easy. Oh God, help me today. It's easy to get wrapped up in things that will rob us of that precious commodity of 24 hours of time. Amen. They will rob us of our time. Things that may have never been God's intention in the first place. Psalm 10 verse four says this in his pride. In his pride, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek the Lord. And in all of his thoughts, there is no room for God. So what am I saying today? We have to ask ourselves this question. Is this something that contributes to the purposes and the plans and the will of God for my life? It might be okay for your sister to do it. It might be okay for your brother to do it. But God, is it your will for my life? Is this something that's going to advance the kingdom of God? Or is this something that's just going to advance my own kingdom? Because I tell you, I'm 43 years old. I am not interested in my kingdom anymore. I'm interested in the kingdom of God going forward. Oh, Lopo Hallelujah. If the answer is no, then what we've got to do, we've got to learn to let those things go. We've got to learn to let them go. And here's the second question. Do I have perfect peace about this decision? Oh my, and this is a mark of maturity. Do I have perfect peace about this decision? Because there are times in life when the Holy Spirit will just prompt you and he'll just say yes. And he'll just say no. And you'll know immediately in your spirit whether that is or is not the will of God. But can I tell you most of the time it doesn't happen that way. Most of the time it does not happen that way. Day in and day out decisions you'll have to make. Is this the car you want me to have? Is this the house you want me to have? Is this the school you want me to go to? Is this the person you want me to marry? And I'm just going to give you some little advice. 
And this has helped me. And I can't stand up here and say that I have always heeded this advice. I I have made some mistakes and there's some times that I have not waited for the perfect peace of God to lead me. And I have 100% of the time regretted that decision. Hallelujah. Here's the first one. Don't move hastily. When you're waiting on the Lord, don't move hastily. Number two, pray about it. Tell your neighbor that. Are y'all with me? Pray about it. And then you got to do this. You got to pray about it some more. Pray about it and then pray about it some more. And here's number three. Wait for his perfect peace. If you don't have peace about it, then don't move on it. If you got a red flag up in your spirit, you better learn to be attentive to those things. Isaiah 26 and 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. We can guard against distractions when we learn to wait on the perfect peace of the Lord to lead us. When we learn to let his perfect peace give our heart direction, give our mind direction, we're going to be so less apt to get off track, to get derailed by our own dreams and our own plans. How many of y'all will say with me, I want the plans of God in my life. I want the dreams of God in my life. I want the purposes of God in my life. Here's the third one. We can be distracted by our worries and by our fears. Here's what I mean. How many times do we get down to pray and there's no faith involved in what we're doing there's no petitioning there's no real prayer going on i mean we've assumed the posture of prayer but our heart has not assumed the posture of prayer i know people and you know people they don't just worry and 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 fret and fear about everything in their lives and everything in the church and everything in the children's lives it's almost like there's people that get addicted to fear and worry like people get addicted to alcohol and drugs it's like they can't function unless they're going through a day without worrying about something or without being afraid of something maybe i'm the only one that knows people like that does anybody else know people like that hallelujah we get addicted to worry we get addicted to fear we get consumed by it you know fear can just consume you and i've preached and spoken before about dealing with fear in my own personal life and how the the lord delivered me from that i promise you something in my own natural personality and sister pat over here we have a dear friend here from Tennessee, she's a mighty woman of God. She will tell you, she will amen me on this. I am a shy, introverted person, just in my natural personality. But I'm telling you, when the Holy Ghost gets on you, you can be as bold as a lion. (laughs) Never tell the Holy Ghost what you're not going to do, because he has such a sense of humor. I promise you that he has a sense of humor. And usually those things that you say you're not going to do in church, you know, that's what you end up doing. And, you know, I've thought about that. I think it's just a pride thing. I think it's just the Lord saying, yep, you said you weren't going to do that. But I got in the final say, humble yourself before the Lord. Don't put any limits on him. Don't put any limits on him because he can use you in a mighty way mighty way but worry and fear those days they turn to weeks and those weeks they'll turn into years and before you know it half of your life has drifted away and you've missed the plan of God because you were always afraid you've missed the plan of God because you were always worried about things you refuse to just learn to release it to God that when you get down on your knees and pray you don't hold on to those things you leave them on the altar you let the Lord take care of it Joshua 1 and 9 says this have I not commanded you be strong tell your neighbor be strong 
Come on, say it with some fire. Be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that he's with me wherever I go. Come on, let's give him some praise. Let's take a few moments right here and thank him for his abiding presence. Thank him that he never leaves us, that he never forsakes us. That is with us even into the end of the age. Oh, Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that we can live above fear. We thank you for your mighty power that works in us. Oh, we are so thankful. That's the third one. Being distracted by your worry and fear. And here's the fourth one. And I had so many that I wanted to go through. But I know that time can get away from us. But I know that this is, this is really the most important one where I feel like the Holy Spirit wanted me to go today. We can be distracted by people. Just let that sink in for a moment. We can be distracted by people in our Christian walk. We can lose our focus on God and put our focus on man. And we get in a really bad way when we get that way. We can get distracted by what they did or what they didn't do. And I'm getting ahead of myself right now. But I just want to bring this out first. We can be distracted by people in our, what does it say right there? We can be distracted by people in our past. Oh, Lord, help me. Maybe it is a broken relationship that you never got healed on the inside from. It could be a divorce. It could be an apology that you never got, that you've been waiting for for 25 years and you never got that apology. Lord, help me, Jesus, right here. It could be a parent that never gave you the attention that you thought you needed. It could be a church member that said something that hurt your feelings. It could be a church leader that said something or did something that hurt your feelings. And here's what happened. You put up that wall of offense. And what does that wall of offense do? Here's what offense does. It becomes offense. You hear that? Offense can become offense. What does offense do? Offense holds you in. And that's what happens when you let offense take root in your heart. You're putting something there that you can never get past. You're really holding yourself back because you refuse to forgive. Amen. What it is literally when you hold offense in your heart, it's like the bait on the trap. Now at our house and in our neighbor's house and our neighbor two doors down house, we've all been dealing with some armadillos in Johnston. They tearing up my yard. They're tearing up my neighbor's yard. And we have not been successful in catching our armadillos yet. But what do you do when you have an armadillo in your yard? You get a trap. What do you put on that trap? Y'all don't be shy. You put some bait on that trap. And that armadillo, he smells that bait. I guess he smells it. I don't know how they know that it's in there. But, but he smells that bait. And he walks toward that that he smells. And, and, and that bait's on the inside of this trap. And, and he walks in that trap not knowing because it's hidden. Not knowing because it's hidden. Do you know that offense is a trap and it's hidden? And we don't even know when we fall into it a lot of times. But that armadillo, he'll walk into that trap. He will walk and, and, and that thing will smell good to him. And as soon as he puts his hands on it, what happens at the end of the trap? The door shuts and then he can't get out. And that's what unforgiveness will do in your life. You have put yourself in a prison and you cannot get out of it until you learn to release those things that are behind you. Until you learn to say, God, I forgive give. God, it's all right. Maybe they didn't acknowledge me. Maybe they didn't love me. Maybe they didn't support me, but I'll say what Paul said, but the Lord was on my side. The Lord was my father. The 
Lord was my mother. The Lord was my keeper. The Lord was my portion. I'm so thankful for the Lord today. Amen. But there's people all around us and they're trapped in their past. They're bound up like Lazarus in grave clothes. They're bound up in shame. They're bound up in regret. They're bound up in the spirit of rejection. They're bound up with their disappointments. God, if I would have just did this different, then something would, things would definitely be different in my life. And what happens is we get stuck in a place and stuck in a time. It's just like a time warp. We get stuck in the 1970s or we get stuck in the 1990s we get stuck in that place when that offense occurred and we can never get past it hallelujah surely there were days when the apostle paul his mind wandered back To when he stood there and, and watched him stone Stephen. And Stephen's life drifted away. And, and Paul was pretty much in charge of that whole debacle. There was times when he wandered back. And, and to the, the believers in the early church that he had persecuted. To the hatred that he had spewed out to those early sects. But I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit didn't allow Paul to stay there very long. Because he allowed Paul to write in Philippians chapter 3, brothers, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, I forget. I forget those things that are behind me. I forget those things that are behind me and I reach toward those things that are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. I forget the past and I press toward my future. That's what we need to do today. We need to forget the past and we need to take our hands and press toward the future. You've probably heard this before. It says only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. Our pastor has preached on significance. Wanting so much. And I know you've heard his heart like I have. And it has stirred something in me. And I pray it has stirred this church to do something of eternal significance. But to do it, brothers and sisters, we've got to let go of these distractions. We've got to let go people in our past that have distracted us. And not only that, but people in our present walk that will distract us from the will and the purposes of God. Because I just want to tell you that the closer you get to alignment with God's purpose and alignment with God's call on your life, the more that the enemy of your souls will send people to distract you. Let me say that again. The closer you get to God's perfect will, the more he will send people to distract you, to derail you, to get you off course, to get your eyes off focus. Hallelujah. Y'all know this is the word of God today. Let me just speak to the single folks today. If he's the right one or if she's the right one, then they will never cause you to stay away from the house of the Lord. If he's the right one or if she's the right one, they will never cause you to compromise your convictions. They will encourage you to walk holy. They will encourage you in your, in your walk with the Lord. The right person will encourage you to be all that God has called you to be. They will recognize that there's something different on your life. And they will recognize that if I want to date this person, if I want to date this girl, or if I want to date this guy, then I'm going to have to help her. I'm going to have to help him. See, that's what marriage is all about. You're a help meet. You help each other. But this can go a lot deeper. 
than just the single folks today. All of us have a human inclination to set our eyes on people. I do it. You do it. We all do it. Let's just be real today. We all do it. And can I tell you this? 100% of the time, people are going to disappoint you. 100% 100% of the time, people are going to let you down. And why is that? Because none of us are perfect. All of us are wrapped up in flesh. And as long as we have this flesh to deal with, yes, we walk holy. And yes, we fix our eyes on Jesus. And I believe that we should be set apart. And there's, the world should be able to look at us and tell that we're different. We should look different than the world. We should act different than the world. Yes, but we all going to mess up. We're all going to make mistakes. But here's what we have to do. We can get so distracted by people. We, it's like we get attached to a person, and when that person falls, they're going to take you down with them. That's what's going to happen when your focus is not on Christ, but your focus is on people. When they fall, you're going to fall too. When they leave church, you're going to leave church too. Amen? And here's what we have to do. We have to stop letting people dictate how far we go in the Lord for that very reason. God and God alone is our source. And we've got to redirect our eyes back to him today. That God and God alone is our fountain. And God and God alone is our portion. And God and God alone is our supply. If I never preach another sermon, you got to know that God is your source. If Pastor Terry were something to happen to him today you got to know that God is your source and with him he has everlasting supply he he's the God of more than enough he there is no lack in God as a matter of fact there is only greater in the Lord amen when we get our eyes off of people and get our eyes back on Jesus get our eyes back on Jesus then we're going to live a life that is a whole lot less distracted y'all might not be loud today but i pray this is getting in your spirit because i'm telling you this has convicted me even this week as i have studied so here's what we have to do number one refocus our gaze on jesus colossians chapter 3 If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things that are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind. Say that with me. Set your mind. Say it again. Set your mind. Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. My brothers and my sisters today. To set our mind on the Lord, it's a fight. To focus on, the, on God, it, it, it's a fight. It can be a struggle. But I'm going to tell you this, it's a fight that we cannot, we cannot walk away from. It's a fight worth fighting. Because when it comes to spiritual discipline in your life, you're never just going to stumble into being a mature Christian. You're never just going to wake up one morning and that thing has just taken root in your life and, and you're just a, you, you've just stumbled into maturity. You don't just stumble into living right. You don't just stumble into renewing your mind. It comes through what you do each and every day. It comes through daily discipline. We don't like that word. Daily discipline, daily habits, what you do daily has to be focused on Jesus. Amen. Number two, recognize your own unique inclinations. What does that mean? Satan has distractions and they are customized especially for you. What distracts Sister Candy might not have any hold on me. What distracts a young person might not distract some of us that are more mature. And the first thing we have to do is just be more aware. We have to bring those things that are uniquely our inept inclinations. What's going to take our eyes off focus? We have to recognize what they are. And we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest about what our weaknesses are. 
Don't pretend that they're not there. We all have weaknesses. We all have things that will hold us back. Be honest about your weaknesses, about what you need to change. And it can be just as simple as this. On that phone, when I'm on social media, if there's something that comes up in my feed and it causes ugly thoughts to rise up in my head, don't keep following that person. Now, by ugly thoughts, that might mean something different for me than it means for you. But just as sure as there is a follow button, there is an unfollow button. And even better than that is the block button. Because that thing right there is feeding you. And you have to ask yourself, what is it feeding me? If it's feeding your flesh, you're in trouble. If it's feeding your spirit, then praise be to God. Praise be to God. We have to recognize our own unique inclinations. We have to be honest about them. Here's the third thing, and I'm almost done. We have to refocus on God's original intention for our lives. Spend your time doing what you're passionate about because that will feed you more than anything else. For me, it's music. Spend your time in those areas that breathe life into you. It might be visiting in the hospital. It might be like Sister Sherry using her talents and her crafts, those things to just bless people. And again, it's unique. We're all unique. And there's things that will bring life into you. And that's an indicator of what you were created for. Spend your time doing those things because I promise you his plans are really, really good. They are mind-blowing good. Help us get a revelation, Father, that your plans are for our good and not evil. Hallelujah. I mean better than we ever imagined good. And see, we have a hard time grasping that because we think God's out to get us. He's not out to get us. He's out to bless us. He's out to show his favor on our lives. But let me tell you, it requires obedience. God's not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of people who will take him at his word and live according to his truth. Amen. So refocus on what his intention for your life is. Here's the fourth one. I like this one. We have to reduce the noise. And what I'm talking about is not that, because like I said, that's easy to turn off. But we have to reduce the mental noise, the things in our mind. You lay down in the bed at night, and all, you're doing, all you can do is just think about everything going on in your life. You can't even sleep at night because the mental noise is so loud. Can I tell you one of the simplest ways to get yourself out of that mental arena. Because there's one thing about the mental arena is it will wear you down and it will wear you out trying to overthink everything, trying to figure everything out. Sometimes you just got to say, I can't figure this out today. I just give it unto the Lord. But Jude chapter one, verse 20 says, but you beloved building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy ghost, praying in the Holy spirit. The mental arena can be so exhausting, but we learn when we get comfortable in going into that place of the spirit, when we get comfortable and we know that we can pray in the spirit and we know that we can worship in the spirit and we can turn on music that is anointed and and we can go to that place and it's actually not a place it's actually on the inside of us amen that gets us out of that overthinking exhausting wearying mentally noisy place am i making sense to y'all and see that's why you need to be filled with the holy ghost and that's not my sermon today but you do you need to know that experience and not just as a one-time experience. 
See, we think, well, that's just something the pastor needs to do. Or that's just something Sister Tracy needs to do. No, that's something that everyone under the sound of my voice needs in their life. Why? Because the world can weary us. But I'm thankful that he is a fountain that never runs dry. Can we give him praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. Number five. Here's the last one. We have to resist the devil. James chapter four, verse seven. Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It gets a whole lot easier to resist the devil when you submit to God. Amen. We like to leave that part out. But in order to be strong enough to resist, you've got to come and submit. You've got to come and humble yourself and say, God, there's things in me that I want to change. And I am powerless to change them in my own self. But God, I know that your power is great. So I submit to you today. In the natural, when we're wanting to build up our muscles, Sister Becky, <laughs> she told me this morning that she was sore because she had worked out really hard yesterday. Our muscles get sore, but they will eventually get stronger because we push against resistance. That's why, especially us ladies, we need to do resistance training. You know, it's good for your bones. I'm going to give you a little health advice today. Resistance training. See, you didn't know you was getting a sermon and some health advice. But we push against resistance. And in the same way, when we learn to push back against those mental distractions, those unique things that would take up our thoughts and take our focus off the Lord, we will find that the Lord is our helper and that victory lies on the other side of that pushing back and that we get stronger each and every time. And you know what the devil will do? He'll bring something different to distract you. See, the things that distracted me in my 20s, pretty much I've got the victory over. So in my 40s, he brings other things like bills that need to be paid and, and things like that. See, it's unique not only to your personality, but it's unique to your age and stage of life. Like I said, he's a good devil. He knows what to do and he knows how to get us. But I'm thankful that we got the Holy Ghost that leads us. Hallelujah. And that he leads us to overwhelming victory. The Bible says that overwhelming victory is ours. Amen. Would you stand on your feet and I'm done. And we're just going to give the Holy Ghost time to move. It's only 1212. 12, if y'all were wondering. <laughs> but I did. I wanted to give the Holy Spirit time to move today. Nicholas, if you would play that for me. Can we just take a few moments and lift up our hands right now and not be hasty? And not hurry. Because this is the most important time of this service. If we were real truthful about distractions, distractions are really nothing more than idols. Nothing less than, than idolatry. And you know what the Bible has a whole lot to say about idolatry. We will let days become weeks and weeks become months and months become years. And before you know it, we can spend too much time in our lives being distracted, focusing on all the wrong things. And I'm just going to say this last thing. You know, the devil doesn't have to destroy us if he can keep us distracted. 
I mean, you can, you can be distracted and make $100,000 a year. You can be distracted and have five college degrees. But the devil knows if I can distract him, if I can distract her, they will never be what God called them to be. So not only does your life lack, but the kingdom of God lacks. And the work of the Lord lies undone. Help us, God. Help me, Lord. God, there's so many things I could have spoke on today. But Lord, today I'm preaching out of my life. I'm preaching out of my experience. I'm preaching out of my struggle. And I believe that's why your anointing is in this house. I pray right now for that one that doesn't know you. They're distracted. They're distracted from the truth of who they are. They're distracted from the truth of the love of a father who is drawing them. Even now, it's drawing, it's stirring, taking off blinders. Pray right now for souls. Would somebody help me? Come on, pray for that one thing for souls. Oh, Lord, for conviction. I feel the power of the Lord so strong. If you would bow your head and close your eyes. If I'm speaking to you today and you want to surrender your heart to Jesus, maybe for the first time, maybe you've walked away, would you just slip your hand up right now? Slip your hand up. Yes, I see that one. Are there any more? I'm surrendering to you, God, today. Jesus, I'm embracing you. I'm embracing what you did on the cross to cover everything in my past. Every sin. Everything I regret. And I'm recommitting today to you, Jesus. From this day forward, my life will look different. From this day forward, my life will be different. Because overwhelming victory was secured for me at the foot of the cross. Overwhelming victory was secured for me when you said, Father, it is finished. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's already people at this altar. Thank you, Lord. Now for my brothers and sisters. This sermon has been for you, for us. How many of you will say, I've dealt with distraction. Even this week. And I have no one to blame but myself. But God, today I'm coming to you. And I'm asking you to refocus my eyes. I fix my eyes on you, Jesus. That's a real simple prayer to pray. This altar is open and people are already coming. 
If there are more, then come on. Come on and let's just fix our eyes again on the Lord. Let's allow him to refresh. I've already given. I've already given what you gave me, God. Now it's your time. This is your time, Lord. Right now, it's you and Jesus. It's you and Jesus. Brother Christian, lift your hands. I declare the power of God will fall when you go to Florida to preach. Open up your mouth wide. The Lord is going to fill it and he's going to use it and he's going to give you souls for your labor. In the mighty name of Jesus, I declare a fire that when you go, that a fire is going to go with you. And I thank you, God, for what you're going to do in my brother. I thank you, Lord, for how you're going to use him in coming days. Oh, Lord, thank you, God. Hallelujah. Brother Johnny Blankenship, if you'd raise your hands, just lift them up. I just got to tell you, my father-in-law loves you dearly. And you have come and you have prayed the sweetest prayers with him. And I know it took a long time, Brother Johnny, to get you here. But I'm telling you, God's about to expedite some stuff in your life. And it's not going to be said any longer that Sister Janet is on fire. I'm just going to tell you what the Holy Ghost told me to tell you. That you and her, y'all are the dynamic duo. You and Sister Janet, y'all are that, the dynamic duo. Because that same fire... And that same anointing that gets on her, it's about to get on you. Rubo do lobo say you. Look at me, brother Johnny. Look at me, brother Johnny. Rubo do lobo she tandarama say. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. For the Lord has need of you. The Lord has need of you. He has saw your tender heart. Rubo do lobo she romondo lobo say. I thank you, God, for every hospital visit that He's going to do in coming days. I thank you for every tender prayer. Oh, God, that he's going to pray. Oh, Lord, and I pray that it's not just words. Oh, God, but I pray that that gift of healing and that gift of faith. Oh, Lord, would rise up in your son. Oh, thank you, God, for the fire. Oh, Lord, let it be a consuming fire. Oh, God, he has not been saved very long. He has not been part of our family very long long but I, I i i just know this that he is a man that can be looked up to that he is a man that these young men can pattern their lives after and i don't know how to explain that any other way than the holy ghost i don't know how to explain that any other way than a god who redeems the time i said we serve a god brother johnny who redeems the time oh i thank you i thank you for his tenderness i thank you for his Tears, God. I thank you for what you're doing in his life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We fix our eyes on you, God. We fix our eyes on you, Lord. Because there's greater things you want us to do, Lord. Oh, we fix our eyes on you. Oh, Father God, today we are done with putting our eyes on people. Letting people dictate how far we can go in you. I know that there are depths and there are heights. Oh, Lord, that you want us to reach both individually and collectively as a church oh god there are depths that you want us to go to and there are heights that you want us to climb to oh lord and for that to happen god we fix our eyes on you we fix our eyes on you jesus we want to know you more we want to know you more
We want to know you more, Lord. Ooh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just a few minutes longer. I feel in my spirit that there are deep things. That there are deep things right now happening. Oh, shelo mondo no mosea. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, these are the moments. If we're real honest, these are the moments that we tend to just watch the preacher to see what's going on. Because we're distracted. This is between you and Jesus. This is between you and the Lord. Hallelujah. Can you lift your hands and worship him? We're almost done. Father, for these men that have humbled themselves at this altar, God. These are godly men. I thank you for their witness. Oh, but God, I pray that in coming days that your fire would burn greater and greater and greater. Oh, Lord, that in coming days that we, as your sons and your daughters, would not get three hours into the day before we fix our thoughts on you. Revive us. Revive us. We can't reach and we can't go until you revive us, God. Come on, ask him. Ask him. Revive us. Oh, we look unto you, Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. He is the author. He's the author. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, we look unto you, Lord. We seek you while you may be found. Hallelujah. Oh, I thank you, God, for all that you've done. Thank you, God, for all that you are in my life. Not just in my life. But for my brothers and my sisters, you are found. You are found. You never run dry. Katrina, the Lord is doing something in you. Lift your hands, my sister. Oh, deep is calling unto deep. And this is what I see in the spirit, that mantle that is on your mama. Our sweet sister Gloria that we love. I don't know, there's parts of that that the Lord today is placing on you, Katrina. There's a deepness that's in her and there's a faith that's in her and today it's getting over on you And it's not just something for you. It's something for your family It's something for for all your family all the Johnson family and the Alaba family and, and, and Noel's family it, It's just it's a mantle. That's the only way I know how to describe it Sheila manda namaseya Oh, my batanda namashelo mondolo mosende rebekeya. 
Oh, we look to you, Jesus. Oh, we look to you, Jesus. Put us in the right places. Give us a burden, oh God. Give us a burden. Hallelujah. Lord, for my precious sister, Pat, who has come a long way today, oh God. Father, I pray, oh Lord, as she's walking into this new season that she don't even know where she's going. And Lord, I don't say that in a bad way, but that's just how she moves and that's just how she operates. She listens to you. Oh God, you are her supply. You are her fountain today. You are her fountain that never runs dry. And I thank you, Jesus, for this new season. I thank you, Jesus, for the time she encouraged me. And I didn't even know, Holy Spirit, who you were. I didn't know all that you wanted to do in my life, but she encouraged me. Oh, Lord, and I know that there are more that she's going to encourage in coming days. And I pray, oh, God, that you would lead her and order her steps. In the mighty name of Jesus. Isaac, lift your hands. When you danced across this church last week, what I could see was David in the Old Testament dancing as he was bringing the ark of the Lord back into Jerusalem. It's that same spirit that David operate, operated in. Greater things for this young man. I declare his steps are ordered by the Lord. I declare that his eyes are fixed on you. He doesn't care if he's the only one that's dancing in the spirit. He doesn't care, oh God. And I pray that that don't care attitude, oh Lord, would just get off of him and get on some more people in this house because that's what we need to be when we come into the house of the Lord. We need to come boldly. Oh Lord, I pray that that boldness in worship oh God would leap off of him and leap off of others oh God I pray oh Lord as he's in a very critical and a very sensitive time of life oh God that he would walk circumspectly that he would put boundaries up around his life that would protect him from anything oh God that you don't want for him in the name of Jesus the mighty name of Jesus the mighty name of Jesus Hallelujah. One more time. Let's just thank him. Let's just thank him. Come on, lift up. I thank you, Jesus. I can't thank him for you. And you can't thank him for me. It's got to come out of your own mouth. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for fresh vision. Thank you for fresh anointing. We leave here today with our eyes anointed. We leave here today knowing that we've been changed. Amen. Amen. Give God praise. Lord, seal every work that's been done and help us to always fix our eyes on you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's hear it. Amen. All right. You're dismissed. Be blessed. Hallelujah.